It's time now for the Words of Knowledge broadcast with Pastor Alan Harrington, pastor of the World's Church of the Living God, located at 2110 Glass Street, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Now, here's Pastor Alan Harrington. that we live, the talents that we have, things that some people are capable of, of things that they, they haven't even experienced yet. It's in them because God put it there. It's because God has put something in you individually that nobody can do but you. Said, well, a lot of people preach. Well, pre different. Different messages, same gospel, same message, but to reach a certain people or a certain person or to perform a certain act of kindness to, to God's already, He wants to bless somebody else, take care of somebody else. So He's put something in everybody. That's specifically just peculiar to them. To them. Nobody can do it like they do it. Or like they can. No, no, nobody can, can perform or whatever. I hate to say, I hate to even use that word, but no, nobody can, can do it. Like God has placed them in them to do a certain task to carry out a certain mission. It's their mission. Hallelujah. God's got special ops. <laughs> yes, he does. Oh, oh, yes, he does. And we all have a purpose. Let, 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 let's, let's go here. Um, just to read a couple of things, because we, we, we were all lost, and we might not, not have done the same things that each other did, and, and, and then again, we have. All have sinned to come short of the glory of God. And in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, 
in the ninth verse, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous, listen, there's none righteous, no, not one, but know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Nobody, no unrighteous. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's a lot of sinning. Not just, I mean, not to mention the sins of our hearts and minds. They shall not inherit. And he went on to tell them because those people, they were some wicked people. But by the grace of God, they received the gospel of Jesus Christ and got saved. And, and, and he said, and such were what? Some of you. So a believer has no right to look down their noses at it on anybody, at anybody. But to appreciate the grace of God. You're not saved simply because, and, and I have to be careful how, how I word this, because you do, you're brought to making a decision, making a choice, but you're not saved because of your decision. You made a decision because God had made one. He made it for you. You made his, God your choice because he already made you in eternity past. You were his choice. And we were all sinners. The best we could live, according to scripture, was like, be like filthy rags. A man's righteousness to God is what? We all become like what? Filthy rags. All unclean. We're all as an unclean thing, the book says. This is a prophet, a holy sanctified man of God speaking about humanity, including himself. Praise God. I feel sorry for religious people that have no Jesus. And, and he went on because the people of Corinth, man, they lived, they, they, they had some everything going on in Corinth, but they, they received the gospel and some people got saved. And he said, That's, and such were some of you. Now, then in, in the in, in Second Corinthians, let's see, go, turn right over. The eleventh chapter. I'm not going to read just just a bit, just to get us going here. So we have received grace from God, and what is grace? The unmerited, the undeserved, the unearned. Love and favor of God, we could not have earned. We couldn't have lived a righteous life at all, being un unrighteous and unholy by nature. We could not have pleased God at all. But God gave us grace, undeserved love and favor. He chose us. And in the, the book of 2 Corinthians 11, okay, let's start with the second verse. Well, the second verse, that's all we need. Now, he's talking to the same people he was talking to in 1 Corinthians. Same church. Adulterers, adulterers fornicators, effeminate, just drunkards, re revilers. He said, and such were some of you, you have been delivered. So he gave them the description of what they were, and then he, he, he came right back, and he said, in the second uh, verse of the 11th chapter, I am, for I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband. You are promised. <laughs> Praise God. We talked about the marriage. Supper. You are engaged. You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And through the preaching of my gospel, you are espoused to one husband. That I may present you in spite of all that you were. All that you did at one time, no matter how far from God your former life was, I'm going to present you to God as what? A chaste virgin, hallelujah, to Christ. What kind of love is that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Praise God Almighty. 
happens? What must happen? And we mention it almost every Sunday, but what must happen for this kind of thing to take place? In one way or another, the gospel is preached every Sunday. Death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He's alive. He is alive. He is still saving. He's still healing. He's still blessing. So what happens? What did God do? Second Timothy, you, you ready? Okay. Let's see. The first chapter, I'm going to get that. Just a couple of, couple of verses. God has purpose for your life. That's why a believer should never, I don't care who they are, what they look like, If you've been saved, delivered from, your past does not lord over you. You have to understand that. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. When you've been delivered, you have been delivered. You're saved for a person, not just for yourself, not just for, for our own benefit, or not just for our own comfort, We've been saved for God, for the Lord Jesus Christ. We belong to him. And if we'd read further, which we didn't, we've read it many, many times before. Pastor, I'm used to reading at least every other service, just about one way or another. Sometimes when we gather with people, some people, we, we still read it. First Corinthians 6 chapter, somewhere about the 19th verse, tells us how, how, how you know that, don't you understand that you're, you've been bought with a price? You're not your own. That your bodies are, the, are what? The temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you that you have from God, and you don't belong to yourselves. We, we, we're not our own property anymore. We belong to somebody. Thank you, Jesus, and I'm so <laughs> grateful. <laughs> I'm so thankful. I, I, I can't help it. I am so thankful that God chose me. So, because there are some people who belong to Satan. They're his. They belong to him. Jesus told some, some folks, some religious folks, you're of your father, the devil. You belong to him. Judas, the son of perdition, son of destruction, born for ungodly purpose. God has a purpose for each and every, so God willing, we show you how to get to it. If you're serious, but God just, grace, what grace. That word itself, it comes like from a, a Greek word. And the closest thing in the English would be, pertaining to certain things, would be like what people call charisma. Char charisma, grace. Grace it involves gift, something freely given. Grace. That's why people say because of the gifts that they say they were using of the Spirit of God, they call charismatic movements and all. Yeah. But it's charisma. So Timothy, and he, here we go. Second Timothy, first chapter. Let's start with the seventh verse. And he says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, authority and power, authority, well, authority and power, actually, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not therefore, therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed to testify, to tell others, to witness to, to others. Tell people what, what Jesus means to you. People think, they say, well, I need this and I need, you need Jesus. <laughs> you need a savior. You need to be delivered. And sometimes we find ourselves, actually, and, and I, I hate to say it, but some people are gonna be denied 
right at the end. They're going to be denied because some people denied the Lord Jesus Christ. Mistake, mistake, mistake. He said, if you be ashamed, didn't he say that? Now, Jesus said that. If you are ashamed of me and my words, I'm going to be ashamed of you before my father. I'm not going to claim that I know you because I don't know you in relationship. How are you going to be ashamed of somebody you say you love? Who means all to you, but you're ashamed of them. Now, y'all know me. I don't believe in playing the hypocrite. Let's be for real. How are you going to be ashamed of Jesus who gave all for each and every one of us? Praise God Almighty. And, people need, and God, will, he'll, he'll give you the time. But how many, when, when that opportunity... That, that window of opportunity was opened enough and, 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 you, and you felt it. If you're saved, you felt it. You felt a nudge and you, you heard a little whisper in, in your spirit. You tell me about Jesus right here. And how many backed away? Don't be ashamed of him. The key to everything, the answer to everything the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through him. The way for, to eternity, eternal life with God. How are you going to be ashamed? Well, I love the Lord. See, people, we want to be religious, but to own up to, I mean, to be saved. If you, when a person's saved, man, it's more than just come to church on Sunday. You know, that's, that's your life, your life. You are a citizen of the kingdom, a child of the living God, if you have been saved. And I'm not going to be ashamed of, of, of Jesus. And, and all he went through, I humiliated him, shamed him, spit in his face, talked about him, mocked him, made fun of him. And he took all that so that we could live in glory with him so we could share he, and he, God did, he shared glory with us because of everything, everything that happened to Jesus happened for a reason and it provided something for us everything praise God so he says don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me his prisoner but be thou partaker listen of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So if you partake of the gospel, you're going to have to endure some afflictions. Come on now. Come, see, we don't, we don't like to look at that, be partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. The gospel is going to lay on your back responsibility. Sometimes you're going to have to be isolated from people. People are going to separate you from their company. You represent the Lord right and see what happens. Everybody won't, but some will. And I'm not saying you have, I'm not, I don't mean walk around with a self-righteous attitude. It's not about that. But don't talk, don't talk up sin. Don't tolerate sin. Don't participate in it and see what happens. Denounce it when it's presented. See what happens. Come on. You lose friends right here in church. <laughs> Come on now. Well, praise the Lord. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Some way or another. So he says, do this. Be partake of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who has what? Saved us. Listen, God has saved us and called us. Thank you, Jesus. With what? In holy calling. God has saved us. God has called us. So everybody who's saved has been called, right? If you're saved, you, you must, you, you had to have been chosen, first of all. This, that goes without saying. And that's scriptural. You know, many men are called, but few are chosen. A lot of people hear the call, but they, uh, they've not been chosen to endure 
to last, to, to have the, the mantle of the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God on their shoulders, and they, they're not willing to bear the afflictions of God. They love this world more than, more than they, they do. The constitution of the kingdom. They don't, mm -mm. But every believer has been saved. Saved from the wrath to come. Saved from the wrath of God. Saved from a burning hell. Saved from our sins. Yes, forgiven. Justified. Hallelujah. By the grace of God. So when God looks at us, he looks at you, all of us. When he sees us in our hearts, when we're in lockstep with his word, him. He sees us and looks at us just as though we never sinned. Praise God, we're his children. We're his sons and his daughters. And God, God has no fellowship with sin. He won't do that. So he's delivered us. So it's not just the preachers who are called. Every believer has a calling. And that calling, the Bible called us with a what? With an holy calling. A calling that's sanctioned and sanctified by God himself. That God has, has stamped with, with the stamp of his approval. Every believer has a specific calling that God has sanctioned and not just set aside the calling for you, but set you aside for that, made you holy for that specific calling. It's yours. It's your calling. What is it? What is it? That's the thing. What is it? Hallelujah. That is amazing. God is awesome. He's got something for everybody. Think about a God. All the billions of people it's living on this planet right now. And every individual has their own set of fingerprints. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes, maybe, in some cases, sometimes what total identical twins may have, I have to research that and look at it and think, maybe. But individual fingerprints. So God has a calling for every individual. He's ever saved. Every child of God. You have something that God has saved, saved you for. He saved you from sin, saved you, rescued you from hell for a purpose. And that per and it is part of it. That's, that's just part of it. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. That's part of it. We, we, that's why we come together. Worship God in spirit and truth. Inquire of his word. Have fellowship with God's spirit. Have fellowship with each other. And we have to understand fellowship. We had a, a wonderful fellowship the other week where God, I don't know how many, some people got something. Some people got healed. Some, some were delivered. Some blessed. The Holy Ghost fell. And some didn't really know what was going on. But the Holy Ghost fell. Yes, sir. Delivered. Moved you out of the way of some things and moved some things out of your way. And for some, moved some things out of you, out of some. You know, God, God's awesome. So we all have a calling. And that calling is holy. Praise God. Specifically designated for each and every one of us. I can't live your calling. We'll get to that later too. You can't live, you can't do mine. And I, I definitely cannot do yours. And we all have a calling. Everybody, there are all kinds of callings. The Bible speaks of, of how in the church there are different helps and governments and just it's everything in, in, the, just in, in the body of Christ. But he saved us, called us, with an holy calling, not according to our works. Now that means a lot. I'm a mathematician, so God's called me to, no, God, no, it's not according to what you, your abilities are. It doesn't matter. I mean, God can use them, didn't he use Brother Paul? 
Paul was a Pharisee, and you found it in, in, in some of Paul's teachings, even though he said, I count all that stuff that I had that I learned, nothing but dung, that I may obtain Christ. And he did. He dropped it all. But he remembered the, 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 the scriptures, though. The, see, scripture could not be broken, but he was enlightened to what the scriptures were saying. So he used some of his teaching as a Pharisee. Now that he could really see what those teachings meant and how they pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ, he used them in the preaching of the gospel. So you don't have to be, but you can have talent that's given to you from birth. So he used it. You, you could be a, a, a good vocalist, you know, the voice of an angel and all, you know, and God can turn that. For his pleasure, for his glory, for he, he can do that. But God's calling for your life doesn't depend on your natural ability. Amen. It all has to do with the calling of God. Lord knows I've never been equipped any kind of way to, to speak to anybody. I don't talk to anybody. I know what that comes. It's not me, and I know it. That that comes from God. Yes, that's the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Spirit of God. Yes, sir. It's not God. No, not me, rather. I'm not God. And it's not God's will that we should try to say, well, God did this because I was already able to lay bricks. So, but what we do, we take our abilities, our natural abilities, and we use them in service to the Lord. But our gifts, some of those gifts that, that, that fall on us after we have been saved, Praise God. It doesn't depend on our natural abilities. Our natural uh, wisdom or lack thereof or di didn't depend on that. And that's what Paul wrote too. He said, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You find you yourself seeing the world in a, in a whole different light. So he did this. He saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to what his own purpose and grace, which was given in us. Listen, in us, given in us, praise God, in Christ Jesus before the world began. Before time ever was, God chose, God blessed, God Marked you out, marked us out for his purpose. Put his will in our hearts. And everything we need to perform that mission, the will of God. Praise God. So what is it? There's only one way to get to it. And it all involves God's word. It all involves your communion with God, fellowship with God's spirit, obedience to God's word, sincerity with God. So we're going to try to go through it right quick. Now, you have to always understand the scripture talks in different places. I'm looking at one now where, for some reason where, where it just says that, that God is faithful. He is. God is faithful to himself. He, he told uh, the Jews at one time, he said, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to deliver you, not just for your sake, but for my own name's sake. God's faithful to his word. God cannot lie. Everything that he promised, God is, uh, might as well say, it's already done. I Ephesians, right quick, the fourth chapter. All right, quick, y'all with me? So you have purpose. We all have purpose. The seventh verse but unto every one of us, each and every person who's been born again, every person who's been saved, is given grace, hallelujah, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Grace itself is a gift. And we all have a certain amount of grace that God has, it covers us. It's in us. We have it. Everybody knows the, the scriptures, the, the 
testimony of Paul, how he said, I besought the Lord. He said he, he had something going on with him, he, some kind of affliction going on in his body. He said, I asked God, I besought the Lord three times to move this. So I'm preaching to other people, preaching healing by, by the Lord Jesus Christ, healing by the Holy Ghost. And I'm enduring this. So Satan would, would buffet him. So he asked God three times to, to move this thing from him. And God had one simple answer. My grace. Is a, see, he knows what you need. God's not going to say yes to everything you ask him for. But you will always be equipped enough and have enough grace. Look at how powerful a man Paul was in ministry. You will always be equipped enough to be powerful in that calling that God has saved you for. I'm serious. You were powerful. That spirit of power is in you. You're endued with power. How are you endued with power? From the Holy Ghost. <laughs> From on high. You have a calling. You have a gift. And God wants you to use it. So, how, how's it going to happen? Uh, 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter. We get that one. Let's read this. 14th verse. Now, we exhort you, brothers and sisters, Warn them that are unruly. So is that just the preacher's job? Ah, he's talking to a whole church. We exhort you, brethren. We encourage you to warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. To be grateful and to give thanks to God is what? That's the will of God. Okay, that's, that's the will of God. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is God. What does it mean you prove it? In your experience and with your life, the way you live, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace do what? Sanctify you holy. Your salvation has not just been given in part. It's full. It's complete. And the God of peace sanctify you holy, and I pray that God, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what I want to get to. Faithful is he that calleth you. Listen, so we all have a calling. God is faithful. Faithful, what, is, what does faithful mean? Without fail, dedicated consistent. He's true. Faithful is God who calls us. Who also will what? He'll do it. God will work it. He'll work the calling out in your life. He'll do it. The thing is, you and I, we, we cannot shy away from our calling. Because everything that God requires of us, one way or another, and in reading, reading the Word of God and having heard the Word of God, what's one of the first uh, uh, lessons we learned about if you want to be exalted, what? Humble yourself. yourself. Okay. You know, I, I remember the overseers teach that all the time, didn't you? Want, you, you go up by doing what? Going down. Humble yourself. So everything that God, even... And you want to know what your calling is. It's there. It's already there. The abilities, the wherewithal, it's already there. The means is already provided. 
And the means are always to work to an end, to, for a purpose. Faithful is he who calls you, who will do it. But we can't just sit back and say, well, I'm waiting on the Lord to... Uh -uh. You have to move in your life toward what you believe God's called you to do. And each and every day you live one way or another, your, your mind should, some way or another, should be focused on what God has called you to do. So God will do it. So how's he going to do it? Let's go to, let's go to Ephesians. Okay, Ephesians, the second chapter. You with me? Starting with the fifth verse. Even when we were dead in sins, God, is, God has, has quickened us together with Christ by grace. Are you saved? And he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places, all in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. So you're not saved by works, lest any man should boast. You don't fulfill your calling just by your own works. Because you still be able to boast. Yeah, God knew I was a, I was a good bricklayer when I, when I got sick. He saved me so I could, no, uh, it's, it's not about that. God knew I was a good mathematician, so he saved, he saved me to, to uh, handle the books. It, it, it's not about that. Everything you do pertaining to the kingdom of God is a blessing, and it comes, the, that charisma, that ability that you have to handle certain situations like nobody else, that is a gift from God to be used for his purpose. And then the Bible tells us in the 10th verse, say, we already read that faithful is, is he who calls us, and he'll do it. He'll do it. Praise God. Why? For we, if you have been saved, you can say this, for we are what? His We're his workmanship. We're his workmanship. That God has taken dirt and brought life to it, brought, brought a man. And when that man fell, God deposited a portion of his spirit in that individual and made him and her a new creation in Christ Jesus. Everything about your life, if you love God, now you love, we're going to read it. If you love God, everything about your life will work out the means that you get involved, whatever it is, to the, to the purpose that God wants, wants to fulfill in your life. Your, your purpose, this is not just for you. It's for God. It's for the glory of God. We are his workmanship. Praise God. Who else could save a man's soul eternally? Only God. We, who, who can change a man's character or man's life? Thank you, Jesus. We are God's masterpiece. We are. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Unto good works. So being say I'm saved and I go to church every Sunday, that's not enough. You to participate with, with God's spirit. See, we, we had a good... You know what we do when we shake hands with each other? We, and it's true. This, we're, actually, we're, we're doing work. We call, we're fellowshipping with each other. Okay. That, the, the handshake is just the evidence of the fellowship. That's all it is. The handshake is not a fellowship. Come on now. No. The embrace, the hug, the kiss. We call it fellowshipping because that's, that's, what, that's what we know, you know? That, to, to have fellowship is like a communion. We're involved with each other. We participate with each other. 
that word, it, it even uh, sort of covers and picks up on the word where, where in the message where it says about jointly participate, you know, uh, with, with, with the teacher, that one. That word, though, koinonias, yes, that word shows up in, in, in when you study it, looking about fellowship. Yes, we have communion. We participate with each other. It's not just a, a church thing, and, so, and, and, and we do. And, 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 and boy, that's, some people used to say this Sunday, and it's true, is the most segregated time of, of every week. Sundays. Just black and white, just, just separated. They're not just along the racial issues and, and barriers. But we have fellowship. We say we do. We come to fellowship with God's spirit. We come to be involved with God's spirit, to participate with God's spirit, to have fellowship with one, one another, to participate with each other in, in the worship of God, to inquire of God together. But unless we have to, we won't speak to certain people. Come on now. There's no fellowship of the spirit there. And we might, I hope, we, I hope that's in here, but we'll, we'll read it. We are God's workmanship. So God has called you for a reason, for a purpose. He didn't call you just to be a good person. That's still, no matter what, there's none good but one, just God. He's God. He's, God is good. We're saved. And he wants, he wants us to live the life. He, he, what he wants to do is show his life inside of us. And, and to show his generosity to the rest of the world, to show his compassion to the rest of the world, to give, to show his love to people who haven't been loved, to pick people up who, who the world, who life is knocked down to help them. So that the world will do what? They'll see your good works. And, that, and, and they, they won't give you praise. They might, people will do that. They'll say, thank you so much. I appreciate it. it it'll be about it. That's, that's okay. That's, that's good. But people will, will recognize God. They'll see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. So God has created us already unto good works. Listen, which God has before ordained, before time was, was ever formed, before ordained that we should walk in them. So how's it going to happen? We're, go, we're getting to it. Romans the 8th chapter. It's funny how when God called Moses, Moses thought because he had a speech impediment that he said, you, you can't, why don't you get somebody else? I, I don't want to do it. You know, he's, I, I, I can't do it. And God, well, I called you to do it. I raised you up to do it. I want to get glory out of your life. I'm going to use you. And Moses just kept on insisting. He said, well, why don't you just, especially once he'd, uh, he got in trouble in Egypt for killing a man for assaulting a, a, a fellow Jew, a Hebrew. And he fled. And that humbled him a lot to be out there in the, in the desert, in the wilderness. And then he finally uh, got hooked up with, with Jethro. He was out there 40 years with them. And he was sort of, he learned some things about himself. He'd lost some of that fire. Because during that time before he fled Egypt, he really, you could tell in reading the word, the scriptures, in Hebrews 2, where Moses might have thought that he was going to be the one. He had that inkling, some kind of way, that he was going to save his people, you know, some way or another. But he still had that, that self, you know, masculine. I've, I've, I've taught to war, I've taught to do this, I've, I've learned the wisdom of Egypt, I've got all this stuff. Pumped up with pride, and I can do this and that. But he ran for his life. And that time away that 40 years took something out of him. So when God approached him through the burning bush, when he saw that bush burning, he went to check it out, Everybody knows that scripture, that, what it says there. When he approached it, God told him to take your shoes off. 
Because the ground where you stand is holy ground. And God called him to preach. He said, you go, you're going, you're going. He said, well, just get somebody. He kept insisting. Can you imagine being that stubborn? God telling you to do God himself. There he is talking to a bush that's burning <laughs> and not burning up. And he can't see what God <laughs> So he's having a, a little conversation with God. And he, he said, well, why don't you we just let Aaron do it? He, he, he said, if you need help with your brother, okay, fine. But you're the man. God always equips his people. He said, well, who am I going to tell them that, that sent me to do this? Well, yeah, we just tell them I am. <laughs> Say, when, when, when I go to, the, to, to my brothers, the Jews, they're going to want to know. Say, if you've really talked to God, what's his name? He said, tell them I am. I said, that got their attention when he told me. He, he said, okay. He said, well, what, what am I going to use? He already had a speech impediment, couldn't talk right, couldn't talk, he, he thought, but God used that man's voice. He finally grew out of that. And still, God used him. You're already equipped for every purpose that God has called you for. He said, well, what am I gonna use? Well, what's that in your hand, Moses? This is my shepherd's staff. Throw it down. And, and it turned to, you know, see, why do we want to argue with God's purpose? If when God calls, that means that that person, the calling is made before the foundation of the world. When that person finally receives the call, the, the supply, what he needs to complete, to, to operate in his calling is already in him or her. It's already done. They throw it down, it became a snake. Everybody knows the story, so you go to this. So. But uh, living in, in that time, dealing with sorcery and witchcraft and all that stuff, and we're living in that same time today. Uh, Pharaoh's magicians did the same thing. Sure did. But what happened? Moses, his snake ate up this. <laughs> so, but he was equipped. He was equipped with the anointing, with the power of God that he never knew God had placed in him. The thing is, you have to start walking in it. You have to walk in it. Believe God for it. Walk in it. Walk toward it. God, he said, we are what? Now, we're his workmanship. Now, in Romans, the eighth chapter, I lost my spot here. Thank you, Jesus. We love this scripture. I'll just read that one and let that go right here. We don't even have to get it to quote it. We could ask just about anybody in here to, to quote that, that scripture. Romans, the eighth chapter, 28th verse. This is a believer's favorite. One of them. There are a few of them that we have. Well, all of them tend to work out to be our favorites. <laughs> One thing about it, no scripture can be broken, praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. We got a few, few that we love. And we quote them. We quote them sometimes out of turn. Something happens, things go south with us some kind of way or some kind of relationship or with people, bothering us. We'll quote, we'll go to Isaiah, no weapon. <laughs> we get that preacher spirit, you know. <laughs> we can quote, people quote it too. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. You know the people talking about is every tongue that shall rise against me in judgment. I'm going to condemn it. And that's true. And the Bible says, that, it goes on to say in Isaiah, that this is the heritage. This is the birthright of the inheritance of a certain person, the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness comes from me. God said, I don't care what you say or what you, what you think about them. They're righteous because I called them righteous. Come on now. And you don't touch 
what's mine. So, so you can quote it. If you're a servant of the Lord, and being a servant of the Lord doesn't necessarily mean again that you have to be a, a minister or a preacher. No, but that you're in service to God. Your heart, your life, your mind belongs to him. Everything. Not just your outward extremities, what you do on the outside, what people say. It's not just about that. Your life, your soul, your spirit, your emotions belong to God. And you're truthful in your living with him and living toward him. That's a servant. Of, that's sold out. Sold out to the point. Love one another as I have loved you. Sold out, you're in it. Father, not my will, but your will. Your will, whatever it is, your will be done. I don't want to forgive. I don't feel like a. It, it, guys, forgive them. Forgive, and you, and for, nothing to it. Praise God. That's a servant of the Lord. When that person, it, it, they, they live it. It's Corinthians. They realize they're not their own anymore. That they have been purchased with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. They belong to God. That's who and what that kind of scripture applies to. And this one that we, and we, we, we quote this one often, we're going to read, we're going to read it, but we get, we're going to read it and, and then we can say it. All right. In Romans 8, 28, and we know now not, well, I think I'm wondering, maybe we know for a fact that all things work together for whom? For good to them that do what? Love. That love God. They love God. It's not just a churchy something or religious way of life and just being, I went to church on Sunday, praise the Lord, I'm saved. I've done, I've done my, my, my Christian duty, as people call it. I did God a favor. I relieved myself of guilt. I did a little something to take the edge off. Mm -mm. All things, see, all things don't work together for everybody. All things do not work together for good for, for everybody who goes to church. No. I wish. I pray to God. But it does tell us that all things work together for good. And we quote that, man, when we get in trouble. Oh, come on now. And we probably created the trouble ourselves. In a lot of cases, we have. And we get like that, though. We get real religious and real righteous and to the point where we will misuse Scripture. All things, and they do, work together for good to them who love God. Now, what does that mean to love God? We know, first of all, we love him only. And that's why we said earlier, it's such a privilege to be able to love him, to be in love with Jesus, to love God, to, to, to have a, a heart of praise, to be able to truly thank God for his mercy and his kindness toward us. Thank God for forgiveness of sins. Thank God for his word. Because it's it's the work that he's done in us. He's done the work. All things work together. We only love him because he first loved us. And to be able to love God means that, that you, you love God the way he says. It's not just about the law. He says to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy strength, thy soul, and, thy mind, and, your, and your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. But to love God. But and he, Jesus said, if a man can't come to me and he can't hate his own life, love everybody else, everything else, everybody. Wife, mother, brother, sister, children, everybody. You come to me, don't even hate your own life. That doesn't mean to hate 
be disgusted with your life. That means to love your own life much less than you love him. That you love him so much above anybody and everything else. That's the love of God. That's God's love that he put in your heart where you, your heart yearns for him. You know, you're not just waiting on, I want to see an event called a rapture, a church event. Okay, yeah, it's going to happen. But your, your heart yearns to see Jesus. You want to please the one you love. You want him to be pleased with your life. You want to live the life of faith that God has called you to live. And in so doing, as the Bible says, we know, we know, and you can know it for a fact if you're one of these people, that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are what? The called. The called. Hallelujah. Are you one of the called? One of the called according to what? His purpose, God, God's purpose, not yours. God's, God's purpose because you to, to lose your purpose. Sometimes it does. Praise God. It, it, it's, it's funny how things about God's word, God's will sometimes goes against the grain of human nature. What God requires at times is something that we, you don't want to give. God is awesome. Yes, sir. Everything works together for good to them who love God, to them, only to them who love God, only to them who have been called according to his purpose. So if you, and we already read that if you're saved, you're called. Yes, yes. Been chosen before the foundation of the world and you have a calling. Yes, what is it? We're not sitting up in God's curio looking cute. Well, he passes by every day. Look at my little what knots. They're so pretty. They're sitting there. They're all sitting there in church. We are to be active on this planet Earth where we live, active in the kingdom of God, involved in the kingdom, living by the constitution of the kingdom and loving it because his commandments are not grievous and everything about it. People talk about the 10. Uh, the Jews lived under more, more than 600 laws. So that's what, and nobody ever kept They couldn't. Care how much they tried. They, tried, they couldn't keep them. There are more than that. Everything that God says is a commandment. Yes, sir. Come on now. Because yes, God's not asking you to do anything. Will you, will you do this pretty please? No. No. These things I command you, Jesus said it, that you love one another, you know. That's what you do. He's telling you. Oh, Brother Richard, I remember, Brother Richard said, ain't God all right? <laughs> and he is, he is, hallelujah. So the things that work together, and they do, everything in your life, no matter how bad it might seem to be, because believers, now this, see, this doesn't apply to everybody. This applies to people who, have, who love God and the people who are the called according to his purpose. So obviously these people are, are living and walking in the purpose of God. They, their calling might not have been fully exposed to him yet. They might not see it, but are you obeying what you know to obey? Are you doing what you know to do? Are you being faithful as God requires, uh, not just for, for ministers, deacons, preachers, whatever, for, for all of us? Are you dedicated to lifting up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Witnessing to his goodness, to the salvation that he brought through his death, burial, and resurrection. Hallelujah, perfect sacrifice, eternally perfect for us. So this is not talking about everybody, only to them who do what? All things work together to them who love God. And honestly, think about that. Hallelujah. To love God, to love him, 
above anything, anybody. They love God. They have been called. And if you have a calling, something about your life, you might not realize in, in, in its full what your calling is. You might, you might know. But something about your life pulls you to it, to something godly. And all you have to do since you call is keep walking in that calling, the faith of Christ Jesus, loving God. And, and if you're walking, already walking in what you know God requires of you, what he wants you to do, okay, fine. Fine. You're walking, man. You, you're on the road. You're on the road. But God ain't going to make everything work together for folks doing whatever they want to do. Then when all hell breaks loose, we want to quote that scripture. We're too religious. The life of a believer, is, I believe the word of God, this is practical. It's spiritual. Yeah, the word, Jesus said, the words that I speak are spirit and their life, life in the word of God. Healing and healing in the word of God. You read in the scripture where boy, God, even when people messed up, but when they honestly, when they truly cried out to God, he sent his word to heal them. God's awesome. He's so good. Thank you, Jesus. He is good. So if you love God, you've been called for his purpose. You're not standing up in prayer. Well, Lord, I think it'll be good. I'm a, I'm a good architect, just say. I know how to build big buildings and stuff. I think it'd be good if, if you called me to do that. And I tell you what I'm going to do. It. I'm going to do it over here. No. God, he'll work his own work out in your life. He has his purpose, not yours. Then your purpose, or his purpose, I should say, does what? It becomes yours. Not my will, but your will be done. No matter what I was thinking or what I wanted to do, I, I, become, I want my will to be in lockstep in line with what you want out of my life. My soul, my spirit is in agreement but what you want. We're about to close out. So how does this happen? Just a, a few more things. Book of Romans. How do you get to it? How do you find out what your calling is? Sacrifice, baby. Something we don't like to, we, we, we think, as, as the Bible says, and we, 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 we've been over it, so we're not going to go back. We might need to go back through that message again. <clears throat> what we're called to do <clears throat> from, from Exodus through the New Testament. God called them out. I'm calling you as a, a nation, a kingdom of priests. Hallelujah. Kings and priests. Tells us a chosen you, chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests. Kings rule, they have authority, they rule. Priests do what? Offer sacrifices. You can't move in, into the, the spiritual aspect of, of being this godly, in this godly kingdom, a, a officer in this godly kingdom, a king in this kingdom. And the Bible teaches in Romans too that we, we rule and reign with Jesus Christ in this life, in this life, right here, right now. But what a pri priest offers sacrifices. And the Bible lets us know that we are to do what? To offer the sacrifices of praise to God continually. But our sacrifices follow in the same vein that Jesus did. Praise God. He offered intercession while he was here on earth. He prayed for people. Prayed for God to get glory. Before he left, he prayed, oh, Father, keep them. I've presented, given them your name. Keep them by your own name. Make an intercession for us. And, and even in eternity, right now, being at the right hand, sitting on, being enthroned with God right now, he's making what? Intercession for the saints. The Holy Ghost 
The Spirit, it, it makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Jesus in eternity is making intercession. Still sacrificial. He offered his life. God taught from Adam on up through the Levitical priesthood and they, the, the days of Moses and all about what the sacrifices were, how they were to be offered, and why. Without the shedding of blood, no remission of sins. Without the giving of a life. Hallelujah. Jesus gave his life on Calvary's cross for us. That is awesome. And he tells us, the book of Romans, the 12th chapter, it says in the first verse, I beseech you, I urge you, I almost beg you, brothers, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies, what a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is the least you can do which is your reasonable service. Why are your bodies? Why does God want your body like present your bodies? Well, what does Corinthians say? Know you not that Jesus Christ is, your body is what? The temple. Everything about you is carried about in your body. Everything. Your soul, your spirit, your mind, the seat of your emotions, everything is carried about in this body. So if you, if you commit your life, your, the, you in, in your entirety to God, God has everything about you. You sacrificed everything to God. And Paul was thinking about the, the burnt offering, I'm sure. And it was just burnt up. But in every sacrifice, every offering, the animal had to die. And the Bible tells us that we're to reckon, our, reckon ourselves to be dead to Christ that we're to mortify our members that are upon earth. We have to die and yet live and present our lives, our bodies to God as instead of it being slain and, and, and killed and shedding the blood and, and drying out, draining it out on the altar, we present our lives as a living sacrifice to God. That's what he wants, everything about us. It's not 95% God and 5% what you think. God doesn't care at all about what we think about nothing. That's the truth. When, when, it's, when it's in opposition to his will, no. He doesn't care about our opinions, our ideas, our philosophies when it comes to his word. We are totally, we, one of the brothers sing this song, sold out. Man, what does that mean? Everything. Present your body on the altar of God's service as a living sacrifice, which is holy. Praise God. Then we read it that the very God of peace sanctify you. What? Holy. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world. Don't let this world be your, your, own, your priority. Amen. Don't let this world dictate the way you live for Christ. Amen. Come on. Uh-oh. Don't let this world and this culture dictate your belief and faith in Christ Amen. or what you believe or don't believe about the word of God. If you don't believe anything about this book, you cannot be saved. If you don't believe that the, this, this book contains the word of God, no way. If you're in opposition to anything about it, you're in opposition to God. No. A living sacrifice, that means that you are completely given to God. No matter what comes and goes, you, you trust in him. Praise God. What better hands can a person be in? Hallelujah, Jesus. And don't be conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here it goes. 
that then once you've been transformed by the renewing of your mind, and that comes with the, this new creation in Christ being formed in you, and you're laying yourself on the altar of God's service. We, we, it's not just a speech that we make, a pretty speech. Here I am, Lord, whatever you want to do. Oh, we say that. <laughs> Boy, we, man, sometimes it's best not to say anything. If you don't mean it. Mean it. Say it though, but mean it. Mean it. And once you do that and you present your bodies to God, new creation in Christ Jesus, this new creatures formed inside of you, you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. That is again, what is good, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How you going, what does it mean you prove it? You live it by experience. You live it. You live the word of God. You experience the grace of God. You see the, the promise of, of God. Yea, amen. You walk in it. You walk in your calling, though it's not yet fully materialized. Obey what God gives you to obey now. He'll get you to you. the specific reason you're saved. You're called for. And the thing is, the way this looks, can't be, okay, be, conformed, be not conformed to, the, to this world, but be transformed the renewing, by the renewing of your mind. That's what people need. Yes, and it says, I, I, I say this through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you. Don't think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according to, as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. There it is. We all have many members, but we all have different callings. We all have different missions in life. He said, we have, listen, fifth verse, we have many, all one body in Christ, every one, members one of another. So having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, where the prophecy, some people have the gift of prophecy, let us prophesy how? According to the proportion of our faith, our ministry, let's wait on our ministry. Now, what does that mean to wait on your ministry? If you found what the reason God called you, do you just jump up and start doing it? Full blast. You learn. You walk in that calling. You can tell when God is pulling you to a subject, and, and, and sometimes God doesn't call us for stuff we volunteer for. Come, whoop, watch out now. That's the truth. Because we want to volunteer for the easy way out. Uh, for the most lucrative look at things, not knowing that the Bible says that even those members of the body, and, and this found this to be so, where well, every word of God is pure anyway, it's true. So true. Even those members that seem to be less commonly, they're the more necessary. It's not just those you see at the forefront all the time. Some people love God so much and they trust him so much that when they pray, you can just about feel it. You can expect things to happen. It's God to touch somebody. They, you, can, you, you might as well expect it. They have the, the faith that the Gentiles had, the, 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 the Syrophoenician woman. I never found faith like this among the children of Israel. It shocked them. And for the Roman soldier, he understood the authority of God. Hallelujah. He said, I'm a man under authority myself. I know you don't even have to come to speak the word. And you have people who have that kind of faith. And that's not, the, all, all believers, if you're saved, you have a certain amount of faith. But some people have a, like the, a gift, hallelujah, the faith of God. And that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, have faith in God in, in St. Mark 11. He said, man, look at the tree, it's all withered up. Have faith in God. It really reads, have the faith of God. Have God's faith that what you speak happens. You speak it in the spirit of God by the Holy Ghost. You declare it, so it is. And it happens. We need to live that way. Everybody has their own office. Everybody has their own gift. We don't all have the same gifts. We, we have different measures of grace. 
in those different measures of grace that we have is enough to equip us for the calling and for the mission that God has called us to perform in. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Praise God. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's the whole key. Walk in the purpose of God. Eight, Romans 8, 28. Let, let, let's do it. Let, 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 let's live in it. And, and let's wait on our calling. And it doesn't mean to sit down and wait. It means to move in the will of God every day we live toward what we believe about God that he says through his word. 1 Corinthians 9. Praise the Lord God. 9.24. Okay. It says this. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all. Everybody's in the race. So we're all in a race that they, we, we run all. But only what? One receives the prize. Only one person is going to be awarded the, 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 the prize. And it's not just going to be given to them. They're going to have to earn it. Listen. So run that you may obtain. And every man that strives for mastery is tempered in all things. Now, other people do it. The world does it so they can obtain a corruptible crown, but we're an incorruptible. What does that mean? People want to receive medals, and which is good, you know, in sports, like, say, the Olympics, for instance. They compete. They, compete, they, they, they put their bodies to the, to the test, man, put their bodies under pressure because they want, they want the prize. Certain things they won't do. They'll get a certain amount of hours of sleep every night. Certain kinds of food they won't eat. They'll train a certain amount of hours every day. They'll do what it, and this is where they will use restraint. A believer, you're seeking God's face. You can't go where everybody else goes. You can't do what everybody else does. You have to use restraint in your life. You have to say no to that old man sometime. You can't give in to every whim. Drink two or three fifths of liquor every night and you want to get up on the fifth day and, and win a race. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. You'll take off running backwards. <laughs> it's not going to happen. If you want to compete in, in, the, in the world, in natural things, you have to strive for, you have to do things the way they're laid out to be accomplished. You have to train and, and you have to use restraint. And that's, and that's what believers do. We have to exercise restraint in it. And once you do, it becomes, it becomes like a habit, a lifestyle. It's no more denying self. It doesn't, doesn't even seem like it. It's living a life that you enjoy. Seeking the face of God and doing the will of God and it's pleasing and it's pleasant and it's joyful. So it says this, so in, in every man that strives for the mastery, if you, if you want to come out on top, say every man that strives for, for the mastery is temperate in all things. He's got self-control. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we're an incorruptible. So I run. Not as uncertainly. I don't just run, take off, just zigzagging all over the track. I have a purpose. I have a method to the way I run. I have a, a, a method to the way I expend my energy. So I run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beats the air. A boxer, they train to to. to what, to jab, to punch, broke bro, mouth? Y'all know about all, you do know about all that. The way they can walk up on you and dodge your punches at the same time. They train. They don't get involved in, see, see I, I don't just beat the air when I train. My punches have a destination. Everything I do has purpose. You're going to win a fight doing the girl fighting. <laughs> Get your eyes closed. <laughs> eyes closed, you just. <laughs> They're going to stand back and look at you and then knock you out. Just knock you out. So you want to have purpose. 
Okay? You want to know what you're doing. We're, we're about to go. So, you, people say, people, some people have heard, some people call this. And I heard, heard this message preached a long time ago. I call it cultivating your calling. Walk in the path that you know God's called you in. And then finally, well, not exactly, but just about finally, in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12th chapter, starting with the first verse. And it says, Wherefore, brothers and sisters in Christ, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, people who've come before us, gone on before us, people God has used, praise God, people, people who've dedicated their lives to the service of the Lord, service of ministry, Old Testament and New Testament saints. Whose, whose, whose lives are testimony to their faith in God. They live for the Lord. They, they live. They love God. They love God's people. And they live for Jesus. And they, their lives showed it. So we, we accomplished about with so great a cloud of witnesses. So the Bible says, we're in a race. So let us lay aside every weight. So you can... How will it look running a, a, a race with dumbbells? Uh, not, not even a, a, a you, won't, you don't want to carry a pocket knife. You're going to run a race. You, you don't want any, any kind of weight. Nothing to, to hinder you, nothing to hold you back. Anything that's unnecessary. To this race that you want to run, if it distracts you or hinders you in any way, you want to lay it aside. And that just makes you, just brings to mind what the Bible says, all things are lawful for us, but what? All things are not necessary. All things are not expedient. You don't need everything. And some things that we might have a liberty to whatever to do, if it, if it will hinder your purpose in life, get rid of it. Come on. That's what this is saying. Lay aside every weight and what? The sin. Yes, by all means lay aside sin. You'll never be victor. A victor living in sin. You can't run the race of God living in sin. Come on. Let's go with it. Might as well be forthcoming with ourselves. Let us lay aside every weight. That's why we, you, you, I don't know how many, how many of y'all run track? How many have run track? Okay. So y'all get out there with your overalls on and your work boots with steel toes in them. No. You wear as little clothing as possible. You're free, you get out there and you run lightweight. How many of you run with your cell phones in a race? No, oh, as, as close as those are to people's hearts, you know. No, you ain't run a race. No. Lay aside every weight and any sin, and the sin that so easily besets us, which is the, the one that takes a lot of saints, a lot of believers, is unbelief. Doubt. Doubt is unbelief. It's all it is. Let's lay all that aside and run with patience. Know your course, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of, of our faith, who, who what? For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured, he went through whatever he had to go through to accomplish the goal. He despised the shame and he is now set down on the right hand of God. He endured for our sakes. Thank God. Thank God. We all have a race to run. I can't run your race. You can't run mine. We, we can't run each other's race. But we all have a purpose. And it teaches us that while we run the race, you can't be worried about what everybody else is doing. Or what they're not doing. If they're running their race, you're running yours, you're, you're, you, you are focused on what you need to get, 
to do to get the job done in your race. And most definitely, what do you want to do? Stay in your lane. Don't try to run somebody else's race. Come on now. And, and we find that, that's a problem. Sometimes we want a calling that's not ours. We want to declare a calling that God has not called us for. That God has not called us for or anointed us. And you're going to be anointed. Not anointed us for. You can't live somebody else's life. You can't live under somebody else's anointing. Come on. You can't win somebody else's race. You can't run in their lane. Proverbs tells us that there's a bird by wandering, so is a man that wanders from his place. He's, he's out of place. A young bird that comes out of the nest before time doesn't know the lay of the land, they flutter, they flutter around uncertainly, run into trouble. And so is a man that wanders from his place. Don't wander from your calling, stay in your lane. And by all means, don't be envy and jealousy. That has no place in the body of Christ. You live your life the way God shows us, shows us through the word of God. You live your life. Seek your calling. Seek God's face and God will bless you. Philippians second chapter starting with the 14th verse. And, and the first part of that scripture reads, and we, we mentioned it, it if there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels, heartfelt mercies, bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love. Wow, being of one accord and of one mind. And to respect each other, to esteem the other better than yourselves. We're better than nobody. And the 14th verse says this, to do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, wouldn't that be beautiful, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I've not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and this is what Paul was saying to, to this church at Philippi. If I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with, with you all. He said, if, I'm sac if I have to die on the witness and testimony of your faith, let it, this was a faithful church. He would lay his life down. The, the testimony, the faith of this church, the reputation of the people in this church, because they, they were faithful people, they loved God. He said, if I have to die because of your faith, it's in testimony to your faith in Christ, he said, it'll be a pleasure. It will be a blessing. Those were some faithful people, and that's the way we want to live. They knew where they fit in the body of Christ. They knew where they fit and they were doing the will of God. They knew who they were. And that's what every believer has to, has to know, who they are in Christ Jesus. You can't know who you are in Christ Jesus until you know your place in the body, your calling, the reason why you're here. Find it out. If you're uncertain about it, find it out. We, we know that the, the main purpose is to glorify God. That's the main purpose for everybody. But you have a specific purpose that God, a mission that God has called you for that you are to accomplish, something that he wants you to do. Nobody else. He, he doesn't want me. I can't do prophet's mission. I can't do Brother Brian's mission. I can't do his. He can't do mine. Praise God. What's your place? What purpose are you here for? Amen. Praise God. That's the message for today. You've been listening to the Words of Knowledge broadcast with Pastor Alan Harrington. 
If you would like to write Pastor Harrington, send all correspondence to Words of Knowledge, P.O. Box 11005, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 37401. That's Words of Knowledge, P.O. Box 11005, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 37401. Tune in next week for another Words of Knowledge broadcast.